Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Betting Life Show brought to you by Fantasy Life. I'm Matthew Friedman, Matt F. The Oracle. This weekend, we have UFC 300 in here with me to break down the weekend's matchups and to give us some of their favorite bets are James Lynch, an MMA journalist and producer of Fantasy Life, and Ian Harditz, an NFL analyst who is also an MMA degenerate better. You can, of course, check out James's YouTube channel, Lynch on Sports, and check out also the first half of the UFC 299 episode we did about a month ago, where James gives us a high-level overview of how to analyze MMA. James, how's it going? Uh, it's going well, Friedman. Happy to be here on the other side of things. And, uh, you know, it's it's just always fun to, to talk MMA with you guys because it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit different here. Usually we're talking NFL football, but uh, this, what, what a card to talk about. I mean, this is, you know, on paper, the best card in UFC history. Yeah, during the season, uh, the NFL season, Ian and I would do the uh, the Friday injury pod. And James, you were the producer on that. And so for the first like 10 minutes before we would start the show, it would just be you and Ian talking <laughs> UFC behind the scenes. So uh, Ian, it's good for you to jump on the show. And uh, with the camera rolling and with us recording, now you and James can uh, talk some UFC for real. God, I, I love it, man. And just... NFL is, you know, always going to be number one in my heart. But beyond that, I truly watch more UFC and, uh, and consume more MMA content than anything out there. So, so pumped, you know, being here with the GOAT, James. And just to his point, yeah, best card on paper that we've seen. I know some people were early on in the process, you know, wondering how it was going to look. But, like, from the early – I have never – James, like, I can't remember a fight card where literally from the first fight, you can't miss it. I can't wait. Yeah, it's it's crazy how they've made this card. So Friedman, for someone who you know doesn't consume a lot of MMA, this would be like the equivalent of like taking all the Super Bowl champions and like putting them on like one day and having them all play each other. Like every fight that's on this card could be a main event. Meaning like you know the first fight of the night, Davis and Figueroa and Cody Garber, and I think that's the first one. Um, yeah. We're talking about two former UFC champions, and like they're the first fight of the night that never happens. So uh, if you're going to the event or you're watching it at home, you want to be watching every single fight on this card because they are really all high high caliber matchups. All right, well, let's start with those early prelims. We have four of them. Uh, anything stand out to you, James, just in terms of like this is either a really intriguing matchup or in terms of the betting market, you think there's something exploitable there? What stands out to you in those first four preliminary fights? There's a lot that stands out. So let's start with the matchup I just referenced, Davidson Figueroa and Cody Garbrandt. Really interesting matchup. Sort of the narrative with Cody Garbrandt and his career, and Ian can chime in on this as well, is that Cody Garbrandt's back. You know, he's had two wins since that losing streak he had a few years ago and obviously fought a bit at flyweight as well or had that one fight at flyweight and moved back up. But he's fought two opponents that are borderline UFC caliber. One of them's not even in the UFC in Trevin Jones. The other one, Brian Kelleher, I believe is a free agent or I'm not sure what is next for him. So I kind of feel like that narrative has been a little bit overblown. And on the flip side, you have Davidson Figueroa the former flyweight champ who moved up to bantamweight in his last fight and took out a really good, um, you know, ranked fighter in the division in Rob Font. So we know that Davidson Figueroa is a good fighter, even up a weight class. And the thing with Davidson Figueroa is he's got some knockout power as well. And as soon as I saw this matchup, the first thought that went in my head is, I think Davidson Figueroa might knock out Cody Garbrandt. You look at a lot of the losses for Cody Garbrandt, he has suffered a lot by knockout. Um, that is a prop I will be keeping an eye on this weekend. We have not seen Davidson Figueroa get a knockout at 135. There's always that school of thought that if you're in a lower weight class and you're getting knockouts, it's harder to do that in a higher weight class because guys are a little bit more durable. But um, I think that's worth taking a look. But either way, if you want to talk about both fighters, I mean, we're talking about Davison Figueroa, who just two fights ago was in a title fight um, that was close that he ended up losing. He was the champion before that. Garbrandt hasn't had that. He's had two easy opponents, in my opinion. So to me, I know you're getting him at almost three to one here uh, with Figueroa on the money line, but I think he wins. Like, I'd be really surprised if Cody Garbrandt was able to knock out Davison Figueroa. I think that's one of the few paths of victory here. But we'll see what Ian says here. But I don't think Garbrandt's looked that good in the last couple fights. Um, so I I'm really liking Davison Figueroa here as, as a possible uh, bet, especially the, the bet by knockout as well. I have to sadly agree. Cody is from Ohio, so I always try to stick, you know, That's by true. my own. But yeah, you know, the no love nickname kind of has turned into no chin here over the years. So just hasn't been going that well. And yeah, to James' point, even these last two wins, like Brian Kelleher, you know, was coming off, I'm pretty sure, you know, a knockout before that, not even in the UFC anymore. So couldn't agree more. And honestly, just in general, like I like betting more on the fighters who are moving up weight classes, like just and actually no longer dehydrating themselves as much. Cause James, I mean, 
if you looked at all the UFC fighters, I think it was a uh, shout out MMA on point. Uh, Tommy told always does some, you know, good breakdowns in terms of like percentage of body fat. These guys were cutting to get to their actual weight. Nobody was doing more than Davis and Figueroa. This dude was walking around like 165, 170 and getting down to 125. So 135, you know, I think it's always been his more natural weight class. He just got into the quadrilogy, you know, with Brandon Moreno and got hung up there for a bit. So again, rooting for Cody, but I think James is on to something here with the uh, Davis and Figueroa probably by TKO. I will say quickly, though, another one that kind of got my attention, Jim Miller versus Bobby Green. So cool that Jim Miller fought a 100, 200, and now 300. But the fact that Miller is a plus 154 dog, I know he's old. He's going to be 40 years of age at this point. But Bobby Green, not a spring chicken either at 37. And my God, that knockout loss he had against, you know, Jalen Turner, where it was like 15 plus unanswered strikes. That happened in December, so really quick turnaround for a guy that, again, I think normally I would happily pick over Jim Miller, but when both guys are pretty long in the tooth at this point, and we got Bobby coming off that bad knockout loss freaking four months ago, I think Jim Miller's a live dog. I'm going to quickly disagree with you there on that fight, only because <laughs> um, if you look at Jim Miller's path to victory in most of his fights, it's by submission. And we're talking about Bobby Green, who's only been submitted twice in his career. And Bobby Green's got like more than 40 fights. So I think Miller would really have to maybe like knock him down and, and get him to the floor and maybe do, you know, sort of a, a win that way. I don't listen. That fight's close. Like I'm not like I don't feel good about picking guys past 35 uh, as far as making like a strong bet here. But I just look at the style matchup. The question to me is, how is Miller going to win this? I don't think he wins by submission. He could grind out a decision, but I mean, we're a couple of fights removed from him having a pretty bad fight against Alex Hernandez where Hernandez who I mean we saw him last weekend he's probably getting possibly released from the UFC um, I, that, that one sort of stands out to me and if you look at Miller's last two wins they're not UFC caliber guys they're guys that are kind of just hanging around in the lightweight division um, green yeah he did get knocked out in his last fight it was not a good look but that was against Jalen Turner someone who's also on this card and someone who I think is a very underrated fighter in that weight class he's also one of the biggest fighters as well I think he's like six foot three is a 155er which is just insane so um, yeah I'll push back a little bit on that one um i might just stay away from that fight honestly because i think it is kind of unpredictable typically when you get two guys when they're a bit older it's kind of tough to gauge gauge it there i understand where you're coming from i just to me it's like the path of victory where would miller win this i think it's really decision is the only path and in, in my opinion all right so those are the uh the four early prelim fights that we have they're also the four prelims and i will say uh, even though I don't know anything about UFC, I do know the name Holly Holm. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I am curious, you have Holly Holm versus Kaylee Harrison. Uh, how do you see that fight shaking down and anything else stand out to you in the, uh, the prelims? I assume you're talking to me and I will gladly answer this. I'm glad you brought up this fight. This to me, and I think Ian would agree, is one of the most intriguing fights in the cards. A little bit of context. Kayla Harrison, former Olympic uh, judo uh, fighter, um, came over and fought another promotion called PFL. And she looked great until she fought a girl by the name of Larissa Pacheco, who she already had a win over, and Larissa destroyed her. And this was last, I think it was 2023 or 2022, I think was that fight. Um, and, and you know, that was kind of an eye-opener that looked like Kayla's maybe not as good as we thought she was. And if you look at the competition she's fought over there in PFL, fell it hasn't been the greatest her last win was a girl uh, by the name of aspen lad who was released from the ufc maybe a year or two ago and really has not had a good run has had weight cut issues and honestly i expected a bit more i expected at least a finish in that fight and that didn't happen now she's fighting holly holm who don't get me wrong 42 years old former boxer former ufc champion is also coming off. I mean, it's a no contest, but it really should be a loss. Uh, she, Myra Silva got busted for Adderall, I think. I don't think that was the reason she, you know, lost that fight, sort of or, uh, won that fight, I should say. But, um, but, but kind of what I'm getting at is like, um, you know, you, you've got Holm who's fought way better opposition, but she's older and she has declined a little bit. But is that decline enough to lose to someone like Kayla like Harrison? But the biggest factor, and I know you and I are going to talk about this too is the weight. Kayla Harrison fought in PFL at 155. She's fought one time at 145 in Invicta a few years back, but that's the only time she's ever fought lower weight class. She's fighting in this fight, Friedman, at 135. You know how hard it is to move down one, let alone two weight classes. So that's the big thing. And if you see Kayla, she's not like a slim girl. She's muscular. She's, again, a former Olympic competitor and everything like that. That to me is the biggest factor here. Kayla Harrison's one of the biggest favorites on this card, but you got to see how she weighs in first because I don't know if she's going to make weight. She, according to Dana White and everyone, and you know, they, they you know, made it pretty adamant that she will make the weight. Of course, she's fought in the Olympics or competed in the Olympics. So, you know, she's a professional, she'll make it. But 
Even if she does make weight, how is she going to look? We've seen certain fighters cut a lot of weight, look like crap in the octagon. So this is one where I think it's really interesting. And honestly, like if you're looking at this from a betting perspective, I think Holly Holm might be worth a stab here just because there's so many unknowns about Harrison. There's all this pressure on her. Like she's supposed to, you know, be this phenom. There's a reason they're making this fight on UFC 300. Um, I, I think there's some value on Holly Holm as an underdog. Personally, I'm curious to hear what Ian thinks. By the way, guys, if there is a situation like before where James and I are somewhat split, for the love of God, trust James here, okay? Like, <laughs> I, I love UFC, but come on, let's we, we know who knows more here. But no, it's it's a good point, man. Again, that age difference, nine years. I do Holly, and this could be her last fight. So I do think motivation-wise, where Kayla, Kayla says she did the test cut and everything like that. So I'm optimistic. I guess the one thing, James, that concerns me is like Holly being on record saying she's unlikely to fight if Kayla misses weight. Like, I don't know. You're already admitting that you don't really want to be in there if you're not going to exactly have you know the exactly out 135 advantage so i hear you it's certainly uh you know a tricky one i'm probably leaning towards staying away if anything but yeah with those odds and especially an unproven fighter like kayla harrison i know sometimes i remember when ben Askren uh, came into the ufc he was like minus 1000 or more like against robbie lawler so sometimes again and also just uh, we don't always see these guys coming from other promotions and immediately hit the ground running so i'm with james in terms of that aspen live performance not being able to get a finish was really a tough look for kayla and yeah i want to sprinkle some on holly why not but can't stress enough again just we talked about the early prelims being loaded the fact that we got yuri prohaska and alexander rocket on the prelims james mm -hmm. absolutely wild there wondering where you fall with that because we actually have a couple fights here where I mentioned before that brutal knockout that uh, Bobby Green's coming off of, but we got Rockets coming off the knee injury he suffered against Blahovich, and then also Cater coming off the torn ACL. So wondering, James, if you think there could be some value on either Yuri or even Aljo, just by virtue of these have been the guys not coming off devastating leg injuries. It's funny you mentioned both those fighters. I like both those on Saturday night. I like Yuri and I like Aljamain Sterling. I'll explain why. So first and foremost, layoffs. This is something that's getting totally missed with the Yuri Prohaska and Alexander Rakic fight. I did the math on this. I was not great in math, but you can quote me on this. <laughs> 700 days was the last time Alexander Rakic fought. So if you remember, he fought Jan Blahovic, suffered an injury in that fight, wasn't able to compete, was supposed to fight in January against Jan Blahovic uh, in the rematch at UFC 297. Blahovic pulls out and then they rebook the Yuri fight. So it's going to be 700 days. Now, look, we're not talking about, um, you know, an aging fighter here. Rakic is in his 30s. He's, you know, not someone that I think you have to be like super concerned with uh, not having that much activity. But at the same time, like you've got a guy that we haven't seen in so long. And he's coming off an injury and all this like that. I think cage rust or whatever ring rust. It's they're in a cage. We'll call it cage rust. Yeah. Um, to me, that's something that is a factor in this fight. Now, look, is it concerning every time Yuri fights? Absolutely. He's one of the worst defensively sound fighters. And it finally caught up to him in his last fight against Alex Pereira. But here's the thing, guys. Alexander Rakic is not the same type of power striker that an Alex Pereira is. And we've seen Yuri Prohaska get knocked out in a fight and still come back and win. Do you remember the Dominic Reyes fight? Reyes actually knocked him out. Yuri admitted this in an interview said he was out momentarily still came back and knocked out Reyes in that fight he's one of the toughest guys to take out we saw that in the Glover to Sheriff fight as well um, I did get a chance to speak to Yuri ahead of this one and he kind of mentioned look I got to tidy up that defense a little bit I think if he's anything close to what we've seen in past fights and, and you know even the rack the, the prayer fight I thought he was looking good prior to that knockout like for a guy who hadn't who had been off for a year with a, a serious shoulder injury I think Yuri can win this and I, I get him being an underdog in terms of like you know his bad defense but like I think also like why are the odds makers and the fans not looking at that huge layoff? That's a huge factor. Now Sterling Cater, and we can obviously go on this after, but um, a lot of people talking about the size. Oh, Aljamain Sterling's moving up. Cater's going to be much bigger than him. No, he's not. Look at the height and reach. They're almost similar. I think Cater's a little bit taller, but their reach is pretty much the same. And Sterling was cutting a ton of weight to get to 135. Not only that, but there's a theory, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on this, that part of the reason that Aljamain Sterling got knocked out in his last fight by Sean O'Malley was the fact that the UFC kind of forced his hand to have a title defense shortly mm -hmm. after the fight with Henry Cejudo. Why is that important? Well, he cuts a lot of weight. What happens if you cut a lot of weight? You're more susceptible to getting knocked out because you were cutting so much water. And I think there's a school of thought that Sterling came back too soon. He cut too much weight and it was a perfect opportunity for O'Malley to capitalize because we know he's got knockout power and Sterling fell victim to that. If you look at Sterling's career in the UFC, he is not a guy that gets finished too often. Marlon Marais, I think, is the only other guy to finish him in the octagon. So that's one thing to consider here. I think Sterling wins this. I, I think he's the better fighter. And we talk about layoffs. 
I think Cater hasn't fought since October of 2022, and he's got a list of injuries. Even forget the injury he had in the Arnold Allen fight. Go back two fights prior to that when he fought Max Holloway in one of the worst beatdowns we've seen that didn't end in the finish. So um, I like Sterling and I like Cater. I know Sterling right now, you're getting him as a slight favorite, but Yuri is an underdog. I'm absolutely playing that this Saturday. I can't I can't not with the, how tough Yuri is to take out and just how unorthodox of a striker he is. And again, both these guys are coming off the TKO losses, but you know, these are, these were not flatlined. Like, oh my God, they should have taken like a year off losses. I know a lot of people that actually thought the Pereira over Yuri and then also the uh, sugar over uh, Aljo stoppages were yep. a little bit premature. So I thought they were fine personally, but again, not situations where I think we should be overly concerned about the turnaround there. So again, I think the leg injuries are probably uh, more problematic there. So also Calvin Cater and honestly, like James, Who's been the best grappler at 145? Like, I don't think there's been an Aljo type of grappler there for a while. I mean, Chad Mendez, I guess. I mean, it's mm-hmm. mostly a striking uh, division. So, wouldn't be surprised if Aljo can get that back in a hurry. And then, yeah, Yuri versus Rockets. Like, maybe I'm hating a little too much here, but what has Rockets done to be a favorite over Yuri right now? Beating, washed up Diago Santos. He couldn't finish Anthony Smith. Okay, mm-hmm. the head kick over, you know, Jimmy Manuel was sick. But how long ago is that? Yuri and Aljo, you know, I know Aljo's sitting at what, minus 175. So not a gimme by any stretch, but that's what parlays are made for, baby. Let's go. Yeah, and, and two others I just wanted to mention. Again, I think we have to acknowledge all the fights on this card because they're all so good. Just quickly, yeah. I'll mention this and get your thoughts on it. Uh, so we skipped over uh, Jessica Andrade and Marina Rodriguez. Andrade has got some serious power. She's one of the few girls, and you'll admit this too, that, that can knock girls out. And I think Rodriguez, she's older. She is a good striker as well, but Andrade has got that power. I would look at Andrade maybe by knockout to get a little bit less on the uh, on the line there. Uh, Jalen Turner and Moicano, I think you and I disagree on this. I think Mo- Mo- uh, Turner knocks him out. Uh, Moicano's got a bit of a chin issue. We've seen that in certain fights. Um, he did win his last fight and he looked good doing so. And he fought a guy who's got some decent uh, knockout power in Drew Dober. But um, I just think, you know, Turner's so big. I mentioned it there. I'm going to double check here. It's, I think he's six foot three with like a six crazy three. reach. He's he's six three with a 75 inch reach compared to Moicano, who used to fight at 145, people forget. And he is 5'11 with a 72 inch reach. So Turner going to be much bigger like he usually is against his opponents. I just think this is a tailor-made matchup for him. And I also think Turner's one of these guys that doesn't get enough credit. And look, Moicano's become really popular. You know this. He's had this YouTube channel. He's had this, you know, really, know. Uh, you know, fun post-fight speech. I think a lot of people are betting on that because they like him, but they're not looking at how good Turner is. I mean, he, you know, he's coming up that devastating knockout over Bobby Green. That That's one I definitely think uh, will end in a knockout as well. I think there's a few on the prelims that can do that. And then just quickly, uh, I'm going to tell people to kind of be careful with Sodiq Yusuf and Diego Lopez. Lopez has looked outstanding. Um, he had that debut against Ivoyev last year and a fight that he actually looked great, almost submitted Ivoyev, but ended up losing. He's on a three-fight win streak since then. He's part of Alexa Grasso's team. He's looked outstanding. But I think Sodiq Yusuf's being counted out a little bit too much here. He's never been submitted. Lopez typically wins his fights by uh, by submission. If it stays standing, I think it's fairly even. I think this should be closer to a pick I don't think Lopez has proved enough against good competition to be such a big favorite in this fight. And then, uh, yeah, last, uh, last, oh yeah, I guess that's all the prelims there. So we've covered everything. Uh, but yeah, your thoughts on kind of what I just said there, Ian, because uh, a lot of interesting matchups. Again, you explained it perfect with Money Moicano. I just want the guy to win. Do I think he's gonna win? That's a different story. And honestly, like once you once we start seeing these six, you know, five, six year age gaps between the fighters, like that's where it's just really hard for me if it is a close call to go uh with the older fighters. So Moicano's 34, Turner's 28, seemingly getting to his prime. He's nicknamed the tarantula for a reason. I do think we could see a TKO there. And then Andrade, like she's just been around so long. I was shocked to see that she's 32 and Rodriguez is 36. So as much as I, you know, wasn't exactly, haven't exactly been thrilled with Andrade's performances. Like she made Aaron Blanchfield look like she actually has a stand-up game for crying out loud. So not overly impressed, not going to be putting a huge chunk of change on it, but yeah, give me those uh, younger fighters. So again, just a testament to how freaking stacked this card is overall. I love it. And just quickly on Andrade, remember that Blanchfield fight was was on short notice. I mean, that was one of Andrade's yeah. worst performances to the point of where I thought she was going to lose her next fight. And she went out there and absolutely destroyed Mackenzie Dern. Dern yeah. looked like she had never taken a striking class in that fight. <laughs> and Andrade was like, just at, like you knew it. it was one of those fights that rarely happens in fights. But you're watching the fight and you're like, Dern's going to get knocked out at some point. We just don't know when. And that's how good Andrade is with her stand up. Like, I kind of looked to me like she was just taking a paycheck. But after that last win, I still think she's got something left. And because she's got that knockout power, I think that will be the difference against Rodriguez. All right. So looking here at the various odds, uh, Andrade minus 135 at FanDuel. Sorry, not FanDuel. Uh, DraftKings. Uh, Turner minus 238. Holm plus 330. Uh, pretty big underdog there. Uh, Sterling minus 162. 
uh, and Yuri even money plus 100 there. So that takes us up to the uh, the main card. Five fights there. Uh, the first, a massive discrepancy uh, in the market uh, between Bo Nickel and Cody Brundage. Uh, Nickel is minus 2,100 uh, at DraftKings. And I see a number like that, and it just feels like, how is this fight even happening if one guy is uh getting a number this big in the market james what are your thoughts on what we see in that matchup well it's interesting they put this fight on the main card a lot of people a lot of fans a lot of fighters were not happy about this because bo nichols only had a couple of ufc fights um but the reason is and i think it's pretty evident at this point is that there's a lot of hype behind bo nickel and what he's able to do uh in in in, in his career he's an outstanding standout wrestler at penn state came in, learned MMA, a lot of hype behind him. A lot, a lot of people were excited about this. And it's one of those things where, um, you know, I, I think that uh, the UFC believes in him and that's why he's getting the main card treatment. And I, I know some people don't like this line of thinking, but like, I think it's pretty obvious the UFC is, you know, they want Nickel to win. That's why they're giving him this main card spot. Like you're talking about, Yuri Prohaska is a former UFC champion. There's a couple of former UFC champions that are on the prelims and Bo Nickel, who has what? Three fights, two fights in the UFC. Um, he's, he's, he's on this main card. So a lot of people were upset by that, but I think it speaks to how high the UFC is on Bo Nickel and what he's able to do in the UFC. And uh, yeah, I just double checked. It's two UFC fights. He had one contender series fight. That, that's why I always get confused by that. But listen, Cody Brundage, um, it's, it's an interesting case with him. So he's uh, not that much older um, in, in terms of like, you know, the, the age and all that stuff. He's just been disappointing. I think that's the best way you can put it here. So Brundage is 29 years old. Um, he's only a year older than Bo Nickel. So he's, he's, you know, again, like not not much of a difference there. But the thing with Brundage is like he's he just hasn't he hasn't lived up to his expectations in, in, in the fights. Um, there's some some performances he looks really good. The Treshawn Gore fight looked outstanding. And then there's other fights where you think he's going to look good and he doesn't end up coming through. And I'll be honest, and Nian knows this too, like the only reason he's in the UFC is because one of his fights against, I think it was Jacob Malkoon, let me just double check this, um, ended in a no contest. But had he lost that fight, he ended up getting a win off that. It was a weird like DQ situation. But yeah. had he lost that fight- It was an elbow to the back of the head. Exactly. Yeah, it was elbow to the back of the head. For some reason, instead of making it a no contest, they gave him the win. And so as a result, like Brundage still got to stay in the UFC, but had he lost that fight that would have been four in a row, he most likely would have been released here. So he gets that, that weird, um, you know, kind of circumstance and he ends up staying with the UFC. And then his last fight, he beat Zach Reese. I'll give him full credit. That was a good win. But Zach Reese only had what, five fights fighting a, a much more experienced Cody Brundage. That's a long winded answer of saying that like this fight's kind of interesting because I think Brundage is being severely underrated. Do I think he wins? Probably not. I think Bo is the real deal. Like I do see, you see sort of glimpses of like not only the wrestling, but like his stand up against Val yeah. Woodburn will look great. But the thing that I have a hard time with, and it's something we talked about earlier with Kayla Harrison, isn't fought anyone good. Like Val Woodburn is now in a different weight class. He lost his fight after that. Uh, Jamie Pickett just retired. That's his, those are his two UFC fights. One guy's retired. One guy is maybe holding on to his job barely. And Cody Brundage at least has had a couple fights in the UFC. So I think Nickel will win, but I just like, there's no way I could even like bet like inside. Like, I just think this is going to be a fight where I think Brundage will look better than Bo, but Bo will ultimately win as weird as that sounds. I just have to, I, Ian, I want to get your thoughts on this. Here. So, I mean, if you tell me that uh, a, a governing body UFC, whoever it is, puts this fight together, and thinks that two guys are relatively even enough for the match to make sense. And these are two highly trained, big, powerful guys uh, attacking each other. I feel like in a scenario like that, almost anything can happen. And then if you're telling me that I can bet on one of them where his implied probability to win is 8.3% with uh, 1,100 uh odds there like plus 1100 like i again i know nothing about fighting but that just that number feels like that is way too low like that you cannot have a professional fighter uh, if he's still like near his peak whatever have only an 8.3 percent chance of winning a match that just that seems absurd to me but again like i don't know because like i am not into mixed martial arts it, I think it just comes down to Bill Nickel being, again, like one of the biggest and best wrestling prodigies we've ever seen come in here. And the reason that he's getting this matchup is because he's only been professionally fighting in MMA since 2022. So it would be kind of weird for them to throw him into the deep water and fight a comms at or whatever in his, you know, fifth or sixth career fight. So 
to James point though, they're definitely sending this is like a lamb going out to slaughter sort of matchup here, but are the odds too wide for an MMA match, especially man? Probably. I mean, hell, what if like when John Jones just smashed Chael Sonnen, and if that had gone to the bell, John Bones' toe was dislocated because he accidentally messed it up from beating the shit out of Chael too much. So weird things happen out here. So from that standpoint, yeah, why not go with Bo? But if you are, I mean, not, I mean, I'm sorry, go with Cody Brundage, but if you do want to go with Bo, I do think you just count on him running through him, James, because honestly, we've now had five professional fights for Bo Nickel. They have gone 38 seconds, two minutes, 54 seconds, 52 seconds, a minute and two seconds, and 33 seconds. But again, Cody Brundage isn't exactly a, com a complete non or out there. And I will say, I mean, as much as Bo's hands looked awesome in that last fight, that Jamie Pickett fight, I mean, he wasn't exactly getting that takedown until he actually nutshotted Pickett and they didn't even call it in, in the first place. So, James, I wonder if, uh, you know, maybe this could be a situation where the over at one and a half rounds is plus 240. Like, maybe Brunge is at least good enough to survive the uh, opening chaos from Bo. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. I, I would look, yeah, there, there's the under, there's also the round props as well. I would take a look. Here's the thing with Brundage as well, though, that kind of works against him is that he has been finished early, right? So th this kind of seems tailor-made from Bo for, for that perspective. But again, this is what kind of makes some of these fights really fascinating, like we mentioned earlier with like Harrison and Holm, is that there's a bit of an unknown with Brundage. Like, I think he has not lived up his, his potential. And like you said, I was at that fight with Jamie Pickett. I thought like if it was any other fighter, it would have been a much bigger controversy, the low blow. But I think because it was Bo Nickel, it's just they're kind of like, what low blow and then they kind of just moved on to the next fight you know what i mean like that's how because that's the thing like if it was if it was a fighter that i think the ufc or the media didn't care about i think it would have been a bigger deal but because it's bo nickel they're like okay that never happened let's just move on all right so the next fight that we have here uh on the main card charles oliviera armand zarkion i feel like i Sorry, nailed sorry, both of those names was, sorry you can yeah but it, it's a tough one to say so <laughs> uh what are you seeing james in this matchup because this one is uh much closer just in terms of the posted odds to where it seems like this should actually be uh a fight here uh what are your thoughts here uh plus 185 225 uh minus uh going towards armand here this to me is my fight of the night. I love this yeah. fight. Uh, this is the like this is going to be one of the best fights this year. So uh, you've got Armin Saryuk. So first off, they both have beat the same opponent in their last fight. They both won by first round finish over Benil Darius. So it doesn't give us a ton of evidence or a ton of clues as to you know who the better fighter is here. But this the odds are absolutely accurate here. Like I think it is so close to pick this one because there's one thing we've seen with Charles Oliveira over his career. When you think he's going to lose, he ends up winning. And then sometimes when you think he's going to win, he loses. Like the fight with Islam Mahashev. So um, to me, it's. I, I look at this fight a couple different ways. So you've got Charles who is, you know, was good everywhere. Like he's got great stand up and that run he had when he was champion, like people don't give him enough credit for that. Taking out Michael Chandler, finishing Dustin Poirier, finishing Justin Gaethje. Like these are really, really good wins. The type of wins that start putting you in that conversation of like greatest of all time, maybe in that division in, in particular. Right. So, um, Oliver can do it all. Like he started as a jujitsu guy, had a bit of a rough start. Like I, I'm trying to think of like another sports comparable, but like he, he was basically like the equivalent of a bus. And then he figured it out midway through his career and became a champion so it was pretty incredible to see like what he was able to do um maybe like a joe flacco like i don't know to use like an nfl reference like someone that maybe was not living up to what they were doing before and then ended up still having success later in their career but the, the thing though with charles unfortunately is that he does not have good defense he gets hit a lot and that's something that cost him in that fight with islam mahashev and he he looked like it, it was a totally one-sided fight where islam was just sort of picking him apart and he actually knocked charles down which was super surprising because uh islam's known as more of a wrestler grappler but obviously charles was still getting hit in that fight so that's that's the reason that Oliver is the underdog here is that he has some defensive issues and he's a bit older than Armand as well. Now, on the flip side with Armin, he's looked great. Uh, if you look at one of his losses to Mateusz Gamrot that he had a few years back, I thought he won that fight. I think that was a bad decision there. Agreed. I think Armin could realistically, I mean, he could have got a title shot a couple fights ago. He's also gone the distance with Islam Mahashev. So they have a common opponent there. Now, that was a bit of a different circumstance. It was a couple years ago, and Armin and Islam had that fight on short notice. But still, Armin went five, I think it was five rounds at the time or three rounds with, um, with, with Islam, which is not a lot of fighters can live to tell that tale. Usually they get finished. So um, there's a lot of potential there, and, and he's young, and uh, he's looking good and the last fight finished Benil Darius in the first round fight prior to that he couldn't get anyone to fight him he ended up having to fight someone that was at his gym by the name of Joaquim Silva and still ended up finishing him in the third round I think what you're betting on in the case of Armin and this is why I like him in this fight because this to me is the toughest fight to pick on the card you're almost betting on Armin's potential that you're going to see a better version of Armin this fight because he's so young and he's still not in his prime yet and you look at some of the photos of him training with you know Grant Dawson and some of the other guys at American Top Team he looks chiseled like he looks great so um, I think what it boils down to is that Charles defensive deficiencies will be enough for Armin 
Armand to edge out a decision here. He might end up finishing Charles as well. But if you look at Armand, he doesn't typically finish a lot of high caliber opponents. Like I think his last like, you know, good sort of uh, finish as far as like good opponents would be Darius. But we've seen Darius get finished a handful of times. Just ask Charles Oliveira. Guy did it last June. So um, kind of what I'm getting at is that I think I, I give Armand the edge just because he's a little bit younger. I think he's a little bit faster and he doesn't have those defensive deficiencies. But if there's one fight on this card where you're telling me the underdog ends up coming through and looks good doing it, it would be Charles Oliveira. This is the toughest fight to pick on the card, in my opinion. I am going against James here and going with Charlie Olives as the dog of the night. I will say this, man, as much as that Joachim Silva, you know, got the finish there in round three or whatever, got absolutely rocked by that left hook in round one. And, didn't, you know, didn't get, didn't get dropped though. That, that is one thing to point out. He didn't fall to the ground. He did get hit and he was wobbled for a bit, but uh, it was not, was not knocked, knocked down or anything. Just want to clarify. Good luck being wobbled when Olives is about to grab that That's guillotine true. choke, you know, <laughs> so we'll, we'll see uh, what goes down there. But I just think, man, like we keep waiting for these lightweights, you know, Gamrod, uh, Arm and Rafael Fizia, like they've gotten these chances. I know, I guess you could say that Armin, you know, finally kind of beat that top five guy in Dariush. But to your point, you know, I'd already been beat by Charles before. I mean, we saw Alexander, you know, Hernandez knock out uh, Dariush back in the day a little bit there. So I'm not putting Dariush up there with the Poiriers, with the Gaethje's, or with the Charles Olives of the world. So from that standpoint, man, I just wonder if it's still a little bit too early. 34 years for Charles, you know, 27 for Armin. I don't think Charles is completely over the hill just yet. I to get that rematch there versus Islam. I believe Dana said this is, in fact, going to be a title eliminator. So you want to talk about the most dangerous striker and just overall finisher in the UFC, it would be Charles Oliveira. And honestly, man, going to be riding with the vet in this one. So very close, but at plus 185 odds, like I just thought this was going to be closer to a pick em. So yeah, I see where you're coming from in terms of Armin, you know, being just betting on the younger fighter on the rise up and he's got some momentum behind him. I also agree he should have been given the nod in the Gamrot fight, but just I think a lot of ways for Charles to potentially win this. And like, James, what do you think? Because... The one thing that's helped Charles so much and why I think he lost that ism fight, ultimately, he gets defensive liability, but when he's fighting Poirier, when he's fighting Keiichi, he gets knocked down. He can just chill on his back and recover for like 10 seconds. Like no other fighters really have that in their bag. Do you think Armin is good enough and trusts himself on the ground enough to follow Charles or is he going to, again, give him that time to recover? I think he might give him that time to recover. Um, but but I think, again, like you're kind of betting on potential here. Like we haven't seen Armin tested on the ground. We haven't seen what his ground game's like. You have to think it's up to snuff. And it, and again, like like that fight with Gamera, like you remember that fight a couple of years ago? That was a great fight. Like the, it was like literally watching, like I almost put like the equivalent. It's like almost like two cats going at it. Like it was so fast and it was just scrambling like so high crazy. level scrambling. It was, it, was, it was such a crazy fight. Like honestly, if any of you are watching this and aren't big fight fans, go watch that fight. It was so entertaining. Um, but, but like, I just like, again, I'm kind of betting on Armin getting better and, and being in those spots where he can be tested more. And I think we saw a little bit of evidence that in the first Islam fight, I know that's a while ago, but I just think like, again, you're kind of betting on potential here with Armin. And one thing I will agree with you there as well. The line is a little high. I did expect it to be more of as a pick em. I think the play here might be, and I know people are going to get mad at me saying this. I think it might be Armin decision. And I know Charles never goes the distance. Like this is a fighter that goes out on a shield no matter what, but I don't think Armin finishes a lot of high-level guys, in my opinion. I, you know, Darius is the exception to the rule, but we're talking about a guy who's been finished a bunch of times. I might look at that Armin by decision. Here's another thing we should talk about, even with the overall uh, state of the card. A lot of these guys are in five-round fights. A lot of these are three-round fights yeah. because of the placement of the card. That tends to go more towards the decision, usually, than it would be if the fight was a full five rounds. Because, you know, again, like, if you don't have enough time to finish a fight, you can't finish the fight. I was going to check right. those over under odds real quick before we move on. Friedman, it is. Yeah, pretty much even money over under one and a half rounds, man. And like a lot of times you will see the three round fights, usually more of that two and a half, especially for a lower weight class. Yeah, Charles is, you know, to James's point, he's going to kill or be killed out there. But yeah, man, again, over one and a half rounds, you know, that's seven and a half minutes uh, comes there in a hurry. Always, uh, always terrifying betting the over one and a half and your two gets knocked down please hold on. But uh, yeah, I think if anything on this one, as much as I do like, you know, plus 185 for Charles, that over one and a half, maybe the move. All right. Next we have here, uh, Justin Gaethje, minus 175 favorite, Max Holloway, plus 145. James, what stands out to you in this matchup? 
Uh, what stands out to me is Max Holloway's durability. He's never been knocked out. That to me is one of the biggest factors in this fight because is great. I mean, they're both great strikers. I think they're both like if you wanted to talk about top strikers in the UFC. Uh, they're they're right up there. Now I'd say Max is maybe a bit more technical. Gaethje has sort of been a bit more technical over the years. When he came into the UFC, he was like a barroom brawler and it was like kill or be killed, and that ended up costing him a lot of fights. He got knocked out a few times, but um, he he has some serious power, and we saw that in his last fight with Dustin Poirier, where pretty even fight, and then out of nowhere he just knocks Poirier out and. That's a really, really good win and a win that I think a lot of people felt deserved a title shot. And now he's got a now now instead he's defending this BMF belt. But that's a to- whole whole other uh, thing we can talk about another time. But um, yeah, like I think what it boils down to is this. Like I think Max and Justin will stand and trade. I think it's a matter of can Max get enough shots in to take home. Like I think this fight's going the distance as crazy as it sounds. But I just think like Max Holloway. You could argue that at some point he's going to get knocked out. Well, I would also argue that he's cutting less weight. I mean, he's moving up a weight class. He's moving up from 145 to 155. I mentioned the weight cut stuff earlier. The fact that he's cutting less weight, in my opinion, means he's even more durable in the cage. Now, with that said, has he fought a puncher like Gaethje before? Probably not. Um, even if you look at 45, some of the names that he's fought, I mean, you know, got, you guys got, got like, you know, names like Volk and he's fought Jose Aldo back in the day and they've got some power, but I think Gaethje is a whole different type of power that he's going to have to experience. So again, I'm kind of banking on uh, Holloway's durability here, but I think Gaethje will win a decision and I think he wins a decision because he will land the more impactful shots. I think the, both these guys will be bloody at the end. I think Holloway will have his moments. I think Holloway might even steal some rounds here. I see this being close. Like I see a lot of Gaethje fans, a lot of people online saying, oh, Gaethje's going to destroy him. When has Max Holloway ever been destroyed? in a fight like even his loss to Volkanovski in the third in the trilogy fight he lost but it's not like he was close to getting finished um I, I just think that narrative is totally overblown here and I think that's people who um you know Max has had one other fight at 155 recently it was against Dustin Poirier a few years ago it was on short notice he lost that fight but it's also a fight where Dustin came out after and said you know I had to really dig deep I almost you know kind of gave up in that fight so I think it's going to be very close um I like the over and I like Gaethje by decision I also like the fight goes to the decision just in case you get one of these weird decisions where maybe the judges look at damage and you know kind of give it to the other guy or whatever but i like gaethje decision here i think that's the way to go and not only has holloway never been knocked down man i don't think he's ever been officially knocked down in that yeah, poirier that fight too. he kind of got him where he like he bounced off the fence a little bit if you want to call that you know a knockdown i guess go ahead but yeah man like i know people have been kind of expecting holloway to almost like have like his tony ferguson moment here against gaethje but i don't see that i mean tony ferguson obviously you know unreal win streak he was on at that point not trying to take anything away or use his current loss streak against him or anything but we still knew throughout that streak you know how kind of untechnical ferguson was compared to a lot of the other uh, light heavyweights meanwhile max holloway listen let the man tell you himself best boxer in the ufc baby so i think it's a far more uh you know technical matchup here for gaethje to have to deal with and as much as gaethje does have that power i mean before he did get that head kick knockout over poirier not like he was exactly you know just going through these dudes you know with one knockout one shot ko uh, uh, after another yeah he got james vick before and i guess after he i poked edson barboza he put him down too but i don't know that gaethje is exactly the same level of ko artist honestly i would i would wonder james because i know what you're saying like gaethje if he can't get those power shots basically use the dustin poirier approach or even the conor mcgregor approach when he beat uh holloway at 145 uh back in the day uh maybe not having the volume but having the more powerful shots that's how he's gonna win because if he's not man even I, I believe max holloway actually had more total strikes land in that second Poirier fight or if not it was very close but again the power came into play but again similar to Charles I think Holloway is a live dog here I'm surprised it's not closer to even yeah, it's going to be it's, it's going to be interesting. The other thing we should bring up is the leg kicks from Gaethje. I mean, that is a lethal weapon that he has. That's another way he can win on points here. I just have a hard time seeing like either getting a finish like Holloway does not finish fights. Yes, he's coming off a finish over Korean zombie. Let's call that what it was. The UFC does, the, well, no, the UFC does too many events. They needed uh, a fight for Korean zombie there. You know, he's, he's on the end of his career. Give him Max Holloway is like kind of like a fun fight for the fans. But everyone knew Max Holloway was going to win that fight. So he doesn't finish a lot of his opponents. He goes the distance a lot. And so that that I think leads even more to the fact that I think, and even, even look, look at Gaethje. He couldn't finish uh, Michael Chandler. Right. And that granted that was a three round fight, but like he does have some power, but again, you're fighting a guy who's never been, fin- never been knocked out, not, not even knocked down. I like the chances of this fight going to the distance. Nice. All right. So next we have here, the co-main event, uh, Wei Li Zhang and Yan Xianan. Xianan. There you go. Freeman. Sh- Shonan. Yeah. Cl- close enough. Shonan. Yeah. Close enough. Uh, <laughs> minus 485. Uh, we have Whaley as a, a pretty big favorite there. And then 
plus 370 for the underdog. James, how do you see this one going down? Kind of similar to the fight we just talked about where I think you've got a champion in Weili Zhang who, uh, you know, really is, uh, is is a powerful puncher. We've seen her get, uh, you know, finishes and and look great. I mean, who can forget that, you know, spinning back fist uh, knockout over Yanni and Jacek? She's, she packs a punch for sure. So, um, you know, she is a force to be reckoned with for sure. And uh, this is actually a really like historic fight as well. It's the first time two Chinese fighters have fought for a UFC title. This fight really should be in China, but hey, we're happy to have it here on UFC 300. I'm, I'm excited to go watch this one uh, live on, on the weekend. But um, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, Yan Shonan, she's definitely turned things around. There was a point where she had like a two fight losing streak, including a loss to Carla Esparza, where she looked absolutely terrible. She got finished in the second round in that fight. That does kind of stick out in my head. And I think that's part of the reason why she's such a big underdog here, because I did think the odds would be a little bit closer because you have seen Yan Shonan improve that striking a bit. We saw that in the, you know, the Mackenzie Dern fight. Uh, we saw that against Jessica Andrade, who she finished, which was just like a crazy win. Like if you ever needed a reason to get a title shot, it was that fight with Wei Li Zhang or with uh, Yan Shonan and Jessica Andrade. Like that was a really good win for her. So I think it's going to be, I think it's going to stay on the feet, but I think it's going to be same sort of thing with Gaethje and Holloway, where I think Yan Shonan will have her moments. I don't think she'll ever put Wei Li Zhang in any sort of danger, but I think Zhang will threat with those power shots, but I don't think she'll finish her. I think this is another fight that we could see go the distance. I think it could be very similar to the first fight with Wei Li Zhang and Yuan and Jacek, where it's just like an absolute war and uh, both are kind of going toe to toe and, and, you know, kind of, kind of going at it here and there. And it ends up being one of those fights that's a bit closer than the odds indicate. Um, I like the over here. I also like the fight goes the distance as well. There's a few fights on this card that I kind of like that, that, uh, you know, sort of method of victory here. But um, as far as betting Wei Li Zhang at minus 425, I think that's a little too steep for my liking honestly and i will say since we've seen uh that kind of those losses that first initial loss to rose and before that it was like way lee was much more of a heavy striker but i'm looking at a fight metric now five takedowns landed in the second fight against rose she got three in that you know pretty short fight against joanna just absolutely murk carla didn't really need to do much but then six in that last beat down against uh, amanda lemos which is one of the biggest ones we've seen i'm with you james i think Z i think zang by a decision at plus 175 is one of the better odds on the card and just ever since you know way lee seems to be in a different tier of fighters right now with all due respect to thug rose and what she was able to do there so i'm with you give me way lee by decision love those odds all right, we have here for the final match of the night, Ooh. the uh, the main event, Pereira Hill. Pereira, a minus 135 favorite, plus 114 going to the underdog. James, what stands out to you? Yeah, this is going to be a great fight. Uh, awesome main event here between, uh, you know, two of these uh, light heavyweight juggernauts. And I guess the big thing in this fight is the Achilles injury with Jamal Hill. So a little bit of context, Jamal Hill vacates his title uh, in the summer of last year. He's playing a pickup basketball game in International Fight Week, which is like the big event. And he ends up, uh, you know, basically tearing his Achilles and uh, he's out and he, he basically was forced to vacate his title because we didn't know how long he was going to come back. And it's a serious injury as what well, you know, as well. So that's one thing to sort of keep in mind as far as, uh, you know, Hill having a long layout. But here's the thing. I talked to Hill. I talked to Hill a few weeks ago, did an interview with him. And the one thing I wanted to know was what was the timeline for him coming back? Because there's been a lot of talk online that he was sort of forced to take this fight. Now, he did find out about this fight kind of on short notice. Like, uh, apparently, we all found out the day after. He got the call the day before type thing when the news came out. So, I mean, the UFC was obviously scrambling to find a main event. But, um, you know, the big thing with Jamal that he told me in the interview is that, look, like, as soon as Pereira won the title from Yuri, and this was back in November on that New York card, he basically had in his mind, okay, what is my timeline to get ready? And it basically lined up with what he has here now. I know initially they wanted UFC 301, which is about a couple weeks later, but the timing's fine. And by all accounts, everything has gone well with his recovery. Everything's good. And I think that's what's going to be interesting about this fight because Hill is obviously the underdog here. You've got Pereira who just won the title by knocking out Yuri Prohaska. That's something that's, you know, again, very important here when it looks to, you know, both fighters. But for me... I think you've got two really good strikers going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. You've got Pereira, who's a little bit older. Pereira's got some really good knockout wins. He's knocked out Israel Adesanya. He's knocked out, uh, obviously, Yuri, first guy to finish Yuri in the UFC. And, um, you know, he also is, you know, had, had some good accolades as well. He's had a bit of a weird career. He's only had a couple of UFC fights. Like, he's had, what, I think, five fights or something like that, five, six fights. That's not typical of someone who's now won two belts in two different weight classes. Um, I think Jamal, you know, overall has been a little bit more active, even though he's coming in off, off a bit of a layoff. And he's had some good wins. Like, people criticize, you know, some of the opposition maybe like a Jimmy Crude or Johnny Walker, but he destroyed those guys like highlight reel finishes and, and fought, you know, took out some really, really good opponents. And what happened in his last fight going in against Glover? Everyone was overlooking him. People were saying Glover, bad matchup, going to submit him like Paul Craig did, all this different stuff. Jamal absolutely, you know, dominated Glover to share, who happens to be Pereira's teammate to win the title. So there's that kind of narrative going in and there's a lot of familiarity with, with both guys here. What it boils down to me is this. 
and I'm kind of taking a, a bit of a leap of faith here. I'm going to take Jamal's word that, you know, everything's good on the Achilles front. And I'm going to assume that he's going to be close to what we saw prior to the injury. And with Pereira, like, yes, he knocked out Yuri in his last fight, but it was close leading up. Yeah. Jamal Hill's not Yuri Prohaska. Jamal Hill's way better defensively. He's a lot faster. And he's also got a bit of a ground game as well that he, we don't see him use that much. Like even his loss to Paul Craig, like he got submitted. They had to call it because he broke his arm, but he didn't even tap. Like this, this just shows you the type of guy that he is. Like he's just a very different animal when it comes to this, uh, you know, when it comes to the fight game and stuff. And I think for me, I think this is a classic case of where you have fans who love Pereira and think he's great and everything's awesome. And obviously he came off a great knockout win, but he's fighting a guy in Hill who, in my opinion, has more ways to win because even if they stay striking, I think it's fairly even. I think they both have good power. Um, I think it's whoever lands first type things. But the difference is Jamal has that extra little bit with the wrestling and also having a good ground game. And I think that's where Jamal takes this win here. So I like Jamal as the underdog here in the main event. Again, taking a bit of leap of faith here with the injury and, and in the layoff, because again, his last fight was against Glover uh, early last year. But I think he can do it. He's younger. And here's the other key thing, guys. Jamal Hill has never been knocked out. I don't even remember him being knocked down in a fight before. And I think that's a key thing here because if Pereira can't knock you out, maybe he wins a decision, maybe with some leg kicks or something like that. But I think Jamal, you know, just has more ways to win this fight. So I have to take him here. We're getting plus money on Jamal Hill. I'm, that's the way I'm going. I, mean, I, I want yeah, your quick thoughts on something. So, you know, coming from football, you know, if I hear a guy has an Achilles tear, you know, depending on the position, that's a really big thing. And I would imagine that depending on the type of fighter a guy is, an Achilles tear might matter a lot or it might not matter all that much. What do you think in terms of the type of fighter that Hill is in terms of how the Achilles might or you know might not matter? Well, I was just, re as James was talking, I was looking up who actually did the Achilles surgery. And it was actually the same doctor that Cam Akers surgery and was able to get him back on the field in five and a half months, which was just like the most groundbreaking thing ever. So Cam Akers wasn't exactly great during that Rams uh, Super Bowl run or anything like that. But I do tend to think that, you know, given a year and just given on everything we've heard throughout Aaron Rodgers and even Kirk Cousins' uh, recovery and uh, sh uh, shout out to uh, Mind of Mansion uh, player profile is Matt Kelly, like, some of the stuff going on now with Achilles, I think it is slowly becoming more so like an ACL where it's just not as career threatening and career ending as it used to be. So again, still a pretty big if, but in this case, I do think he's had enough time to feasibly be back at a hundred percent. I'm just wondering, James, like, I agree with you. Like his ground game has been great. I mean, I remember even like round five, I'm pretty sure Glover had his back like in a dominant position and he was still able to get out of it. So the jujitsu is there, and I'm not worried about Alex Pereira submitting them or anything like that to begin with. But do you actually think Jamal is going to try to shoot some takedowns, James? Because I mean, when I was looking at it, I don't think he's ever even shot a takedown out there. And that's really the only time that we've seen Pereira be in much trouble, other than, of course, when Izzy was able to, you know, send him straight to hell. So I just think, man, if it's going to be a pure stand up fight, yes, Jama Hall is, you know, very good at, I mean, Jamal Hill is very good at yeah being a striker in mma but it sounds like this dude couldn't cut it in basketball and he decided okay i'll be an mma fighter in 2017 meanwhile Pereira has been a championship level kickboxer for you know over a decade so if it's pure stand-up for stand-up i'll give the edge to Pereira. but if he's going to start mixing those takedowns that's where i see hill's path to success any thoughts there james because again i'm just worried about him shooting the takedowns i'm sure he could do something with them yeah, it's going to be, I mean, again, like, would I be shocked if this is the first knockout loss for Jamal Hill? No, because if there's one guy you can do it, it's, it's, it's you know, it's it's Alex Pereira. I mean, Alex Pereira, again, first guy to finish Yuri in the UFC, too. That was very impressive. But um, I, th I think for me, the, the fact that we have that as an option for Jamal, like, let's say the fight goes longer. Maybe Pereira is getting tired. He thinks he's going to be able to finish Jamal and he can't. That's where maybe Jamal can take advantage and use that ground game. But the thing with Jamal, like you mentioned that, you know, failed basketball player or whatever, but like he just moves so differently than like heavyweights. Like if you watch him fight, like he looks like a middleweight out there. Like he's super yeah. fast. He's got some serious athletic talent. And I think that's something that Pereira hasn't really faced yet. If you, I mean, the closest thing would probably be Adesanya, but I mean, we're talking about an Adesanya as well, who like, you know, didn't do that great at 205, right? Jamal Hill has never fought at 185. He's only fought at 205. And I think the power that he puts in, um, you even look at some of the fighters he's fought since then, like what's Johnny Walker done lately since losing to, um, you know, Jamal Hill, not, not a whole lot. Right. So I, I think that uh, Jamal is just like, he is a different animal. You just, you know, I know it's kind of an eye test here, but when you watch Jamal fight, you see that talent. And I think that's going to be something that's going to be uh, interesting here for Alex. And we'll see. And again, the other thing, too, is that prayer is a little bit older. Like, I think people forget he's 36. Yeah. He's not like a young chicken. Like he came into this a little bit later because of that kickboxing background. And yeah, he knocked a lot of really good dudes out. But 
I don't know, you're fighting a guy who's never been knocked out and you got a guy who's really fast like Hill. And not only that, Hill's not afraid. Like that's like, you see the guy, he's like, like I said, like he didn't even flinch when Paul Craig broke his arm. He's just one of those guys. So he's not going to be intimidated by Pereira. And this is a fight that he had been eyeing since Pereira was at 185 even. So there, you know, there's been a lot of preparation there. So yeah, I know I'm going on a limb here. I know it's not the popular pick taking Jamal Hill, but I think he knocks out Pereira in the third round. That's what, that's my official prediction. Freeman, what's your main event pick? We need one. Yeah. I mean, if I can have the underdog uh, who has uh, never been defeated when he's been holding the title, like that's kind of interesting to me. Uh, so plus 130 uh, is what I'm seeing in, in the odds there. there we um, go. I think I would probably be taking that. So, uh, you know, James, I know you've got to run. You have a flight to catch to Las Vegas uh, to witness in person uh, the UFC 300. But before you go, uh, I want to get a quick take from you, quick take from Ian. Out of all of the bets that we talked about, which one stands out to you on the entire card as your favorite? I'll let Ian go first. He can do it, and then I'll save the, the best for last. Charles Oliveira, plus 185. I believe. I just think it's too much too soon for Armin. Maybe he will be a champion one day, not on Saturday night. Let's go, Charlie Olives. Okay, and for me, uh, I'm going to be going with uh, Yuri Prohaska. I, I Listen, I know it's a risk, but I just like, you look at how hard Yuri is to finish. If Rakic can't finish him, I think Yuri lands more. I think Yuri gets it done. I, I think, you know, you're getting him at plus money. It doesn't get much better than this. So uh, Ian and I both uh, barking with the dogs here today on the UFC 300 uh, preview show. Er all right there you go i like it that is going to do it for this episode of the betting life show brought to you by fantasy life please subscribe to the show and the newsletter tell your degenerate betting friends join the discord see all of our bets in the free fantasy life bet tracker and follow us on social media at lynch on sports iheart it's and matt f the oracle thank you and see you again next episode